Hello everyone, welcome to Body Works with Marcus. Today I'm lucky to have Jeremiah Pacey with me and Sarah Kelly. They're both representing different organizations and they're joining me on the show so that we can talk about some, uh, some work that I've been doing over the last couple of years. It's great to have you guys on the show. Thank you so much for, for joining me. Yeah, thanks uh, for having Sarah, us. Sarah, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, about what you do. Sure, uh, so I run an au pair placement agency called Adenac Au Pair, and Adenac is Canada backwards. Uh, so I match young foreigners from abroad uh, with Canadian families to provide live-in childcare that's flexible to their needs. Fantastic, and you're mm -hmm. based here in Brantford, but you, you service all of Canada, yes. is that correct? Yes, that's, that's awesome. right. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And Jeremiah? Uh, I am a pastor at Cornerstone Church here in Brantford. I'm also a full-time factory worker, so kind of do dual worlds. Yeah, juggle it, wearing two hats. Yes. And uh, Cornerstone is in Homedale, right? Yes, Homedale, okay. uh, right at the bottom of St. Paul and Grand River Ave there. Awesome. Well, thanks for being on the show, guys. It's a real pleasure. Uh, today we're going to be looking at some work that I've been doing over the last couple of years with addictions and mental health patients and then also just uh, individuals at Moto Yoga uh, in Brantford here and then I'm going to be uh, sharing some information that I, I do with uh, Laurier students as well and I've been really blessed to be able to kind of share some of the work that I've been doing um, and, and the work actually came out of the just personal work that I that I did for myself in uh, in developing some understanding around how the mind and the body works and um, creating more awareness around what the mi practice of mindfulness is and so that's what we're going to be discussing today uh, we're going to be uh, you know talking about the the mindfulness process what that looks like and and how it can can positively or, or affect the the experience of our day to day. Um, and, and we should kind of articulate what mindfulness is, right? Mindfulness is this aspect of our lives that gives, the, or, or, or practice in our lives, that gives us the opportunity to pay attention to what's happening, you know, in the environment of our circumstances. You know, in your day-to-day -day lives, uh, here today and, and, and ongoingly, we are always kind of confronted by the stimulus of our environment, you know, uh, whether you're at work or whether you're at school, whether you're at church, wherever it is, you're experiencing yourself as somebody in the environment that you're in and sometimes the the experience of that is nerve-wracking sometimes it's overwhelming sometimes it makes you feel shy or confident or comfortable and it, it, it is largely based on you know the different stimulus that exists in your environment but to build understanding around you know how your environment is impacting your body we have this amazing tool that, that I refer to as mindfulness. And mindfulness is just the process of paying attention to how your mind and your body are affected by the stimulus of your, of your present moment. You know? and, and that's what we're doing in, in the practice. We're paying attention carefully to the present moment so that we can see how our body responds to the stimulus of our environment and we can see how our mind evokes different emotions and, and reactions based on that, that stimulus as well. Mm -hmm. And so with, uh, with the intention of the show is we're, we're, we want to kind of delve into making more sense of the way that we, we show up in the world, you know, and I think that um, as a society, there's a lot of individuals who really struggle to be themselves, mm -hmm. you know, to show up in the world, to, to, to accomplish the things that they want to accomplish, to, to be the people that they want to be, to be the best versions of themselves in, in these different stimuluses or in these different environments. And... Um, in the practice of mindfulness, we get to kind of create a registry in our mind of all these different stimulus and how our body responds to that. And then inversely, we kind of get to see how our body responds and, and kind of make sense of why and where our body is responding and what stimulus is evoking this response. Mm -hmm. And so we can do that by, by uh, bringing a calm, attentive awareness to the present moment. You know, and you can do that in a formal practice through a seated practice like meditation. You can do that while you're you're moving through your day. You know, while you're driving, while you're sitting and watching people, while you're at work, you can bring mindfulness into your experience because mindfulness really is two things: it's paying attention to the mind, you know, the thoughts that arise and the experience, but then also paying attention to the body. So the physical reactions that have, are evoked out of paying attention to your mind. You know, if I have uh, uh, somebody that I really care for walk into the room, it completely changes my demeanor, it changes the way that I feel, it changes the way that I kind of show up, you know? Mm -hmm. It allows me to, to present myself in a way that is appropriate based on, on the relationship that I have with that person. 
you know, and, and uh, on the opposite side of that, when somebody walks into the room that I'm struggling with, maybe that I have something unresolved with, my body and my mind, they respond in a different way, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, and, and sometimes the way that I respond to the stimulus in my environment is, is kind of feeling more worked up, more, more apprehensive or anxious. And sometimes I'm feeling more calm or relaxed. We feel this with friends. We feel this with, with yeah. family members mm -hmm. that we're close to. And uh, depending on, on the relationship that we have with these different people, we, we kind of react differently. And I think as, a, as, a, as an individual who's participating in the culture that we live in today, it's really important for us to kind of make sense of that and acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we're surprised by our own reactions depending on the stimulus. Sometimes things are incredibly stimulating. And we respond in a way that we were kind of surprised by. And we've seen this when we get angry when we get frustrated or overwhelmed you know we we see that we were, we kind of aren't able to show up as as we maybe would typically mm -hmm. you know or as we would like to we would like to show up calm we'd like to show up relaxed but then we don't get that opportunity because of the stimulus that exists in our environment and what I find mindfulness is incredibly good at doing is building awareness around why I'm showing up the way that I'm showing and then how I can prepare myself to be able to you know change the, the stimulus of my environment or respond differently to the stimulus of my environment if I have that within my, my ability and within my control. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we do this we do this present moment awareness or this focused attention by, by doing two things. And I mentioned the first one, paying careful attention to my physical body, paying careful attention to my mental body, but then also a big part of that is picking an anchor that exists here in this moment. Right, something that I can pay close attention to, and sometimes we use breath, and and uh, sometimes we use um, the sounds that we can hear. Sometimes we open up our senses to th to things that we can smell or things that we can taste, and so mindfulness is the aspect of paying attention to what's in front of us. Mm -hmm. right? They're doing that with kids too. Mm -hmm. um, so the fidget toys so yes. I don't know if you know those cubes those fidget cubes or having a fidget is very much a thing that's present in classrooms yeah where you know you're teaching kids this exact thing mm -hmm. um, you're not calling it mindfulness but you're bringing them back to their present self because kids have these stimuluses where you know maybe they have a noise sensitivity or a light sensitivity or um, my mom's an educational assistant and she works with a child who can't handle clapping mm -hmm. so he you know they don't take him to assemblies but sometimes when you pass classrooms clapping happens yeah. and it you know he goes off and so um, I think as adults if we're able to have this practice mm -hmm. and understand ourselves better and understand our surroundings and thinking you know I'm a little irritated but that's because you know the lights are really bright or I just got cut off um, you're teaching your kids that as well mm -hmm. and you're teaching kids that you know it's okay to feel those things um, but you should understand why you feel those things mm -hmm. and there's a um, child psychologist I believe his name's Dr. Stuart Shanker and he talks a lot about this how mm -hmm. um, kids have a certain amount of energy and when they are you know being bullied in the playground and then they're going into a classroom that's overwhelming by the end of the day they are lacking their energy and so when they get home from school and the parents are saying well like clean your room and aren't you listening to me there's actual science that says well no maybe they can't hear you yeah. because they're shutting down they're just have, are depleted of everything and are shutting down their uh, physiological um, being is just going back to you know go to the basic things yeah Mm -hmm. Dr. Benson from Harvard University refers to that co that idea as allostatic load, right? Allostatic load is um, is is the mental load that we place on the mind based on the stimulus that exists in our environment, and I I, I think that's so it's so poignant that you bring that up because I think as a human being living in the society we live in today, we have so much mental load. You know, um, we even have terms for it now, FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. Yeah. We've got this concept all around the, the, the idea that our brain is working on overdrive 
not being here, you know, you might be with your kids, you might be with yep. your friends and family, but you're actually mentally in this phone or in this device, feeling like you're missing out on something that you could have been part of, and then completely missing the opportunity to to enjoy where you are right now, right? And so this is this is where mindfulness really comes in handy, and it's so encouraging to me see that to, for me to see that this is starting to happen in the education system. Mm -hmm. That kids are starting to util utilize the tools of mindfulness to create some sort of awareness and understanding around, um, you know, what it means to to show up in this world with with all the stimulus. The stimulus is something that we're likely not going to get rid of, but it's something that we can start being responsible for when we start recognizing that the allostatic load that we've placed on the human mind is far exceeds what we've ever done in all of human history, right? For yeah. so for thousands of years human beings have have lived in a very specific way and we'd be able to manage the stimulus that exists with our environment knowing, you know, 100 to to 500 people in our entire lifetime and now we've increased that substantially in, in the lifestyles that we live today. And so then taking that time to reduce the allostatic load by evoking the parasympathetic response or the rest and digest response in our body is that much more important. It's that much more more essential if we're going to function in the society we live yeah. in today. Yeah. And so uh, this is why, you know, this is why we're here chatting about this, this exact topic because I think that mindfulness has huge implications for the way that we're able to, to show up in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I think it's an important discussion discussion to have. Mindfulness, very simply, is awareness. It's it's a tool to discover how you respond to the experience of your environment, how you show up in the world around you, and creating awareness around being here. Right? We spend so much time in the present moment not in the present moment you know we we spend our entire lives existing here but our mental capacity which is incredible has this awesome opportunity or ability to think about what's happening in the past to ruminate on the past and think about well what do i need to do in this moment to prepare myself to never relive that right and then it also thinks about the future well wh what do i do moving forward what do i do here in this moment with all the concerns and the questions and the doubts and the, the chaos that, that exists in the unknown moving forward into the future, right? Yeah. Or, I'm here, what exists out there? What's yeah. happening at home? What's happening at work right now? What's happening with my friends group over here? Well, I can see that I'm clearly missing out, hence the FOMO, mm -hmm. but it, it, it evokes these, these capacities of my mind to not actually be here. You know, it, to it totally brings me to a place where I'm actually in the past, I'm in the future, or I'm in a physical space that's outside of where I am right now. And the implications of that are pretty, pretty intense because it completely robs me of the opportunity of showing up. Showing up for myself in this moment, but also showing up for the people that are around me, mm -hmm. yeah. right? the individuals that I'm sharing space and time with. And, and we gotta be careful with that. You know, we gotta be careful because the, the, the effect is that we're never here. You know, the, the most extreme version of that is that we're never actually present with people. Yeah. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a little bit of a break. We'll be back shortly and uh, look forward to seeing you. program is brought to you by Rogers Anyplace TV. Enjoy exclusive content for free. Visit RogersAnyplaceTV.com. Wednesday. I want you to have high nutrient, high protein food. Food personality Teresa Albert serves up a garden fresh, healthy breakfast. That's really good. Breakfast at Rosehurst on Rogers TV. Hello friends, welcome back to Body Works with Marcus. Uh, I'm joined here by Kelly and Jeremiah. Uh, we were just finished, you know, we were talking about uh, mindfulness and the importance of applying that to our day-to-day -day lives. And one of the big misconceptions that we often find with mindfulness whenever I'm teaching this is that, and meditation in general, is this idea of clearing the mind. You know, we're supposed to get rid of the thoughts. And I'm gonna encourage you by letting you know that of, of years of practice that, that I've really implemented this in my life, I've had experiences where I've been able to get rid of my thoughts and they've lasted for a full moment or two <laughs> until I think to myself, oh my God, I did it, I, I did it. I did that thing that I meant to accomplish. And then I get to that, that place of realizing that now I'm thinking about the fact that I've gotten rid of my thoughts. Yeah. You know, and it's the irony and the catch 22 of this 
practice. And it's something that we need to be honest and, and upfront about because getting rid of the thoughts in this mindfulness practice is not the goal, mm. right? Um, so, so that begs the question, what are we doing, right? What are we doing in this mindfulness practice when we're paying careful attention to our thoughts, when we're paying careful attention to our body, we're paying attention to the environment that we're in, and we're not getting rid of our thoughts, what are we paying attention to? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to notice, uh, if, if you've never tried this before, is you're going to notice that your mind is going to be there. It's going to wander. You're going to be thinking about things that exist in the past. You're going to be thinking about things that exist in the future. And you're going to be thinking about things that exist outside of your environment, you know, at home or at work. And so the practice is not about getting rid of your thoughts. It's not about um, a, a diminishing the thoughts or, or, or rebuking them or making them bad or wrong. It's about allowing yourself to acknowledge that as a human being, the, these thoughts are going to arise. They're going to be there. They're going to be part of your experience. And so what you can do from that is you can allow yourself to observe them. You know, observe them non-judgmentally. Notice that the thoughts arise and they evoke certain emotions. They evoke a, a physiological response. Mm -hmm. You know, when I start thinking about things um, that, that make me happy or excited, I can feel it. I can feel it in my chest. I can feel it in my heart rate. If I'm thinking about something that makes me nervous, actually, I get this all the time when I'm watching those, those YouTube videos of those young kids who hang off buildings and stuff like that or do ridiculous things. My palms get sweaty. Actually, I can feel it right now just, <laughs> just talking about it like right away. I'm, I'm terrified of heights. So even in the experience of my thoughts, I get to feel a physical response to that. Mm -hmm. And we notice that when we get aroused and we, with different things like that, the mental experience of thinking about something creates a physical response in your body. Right? And, and it's important to understand that because when you start mapping and creating a registry of these different ways that your body responds to your thoughts, you build familiarity, which brings us right back to awareness. What is mindfulness? It's not getting rid of your thoughts. It's not getting rid of, of things that shouldn't be there. It's, it's allowing yourself to get really clear about what is there. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. That was a huge deterrent for me with uh, a meditative practice I tried for years. Mm -hmm. but. I have an incredibly busy monkey brain yeah. that is always jumping from this thought to that thought. And then like with anxiety issues, you know, I can't remember something I did yesterday, but something I did when I was four years old is mm. still plaguing my conscience of how to atone for it. But uh, so I go into that meditative practice and you're trying to empty your brain. You're trying to focus in the moment and your brain is going everywhere. You're thinking all these great thoughts or you're wrestling with all these terrible things. And, uh, it created just this negative feedback loop for mm -hmm. myself that I'm never going to be able to meditate. I'm never going to be able to, to be mindful or never be able to, to bring into that. And so narrowing it down and learning to just listen to the thoughts as opposed to get rid of them, yeah. but say to yourself, okay, why am I, why am I, when I'm trying to quiet my brain, why is this person coming to mind? Why is this event or this situation? What is what is my brain or my subconscious trying to tell me? What is actually going on here? And actually making the thoughts part of that practice and sort of incorporating it into it and saying, okay, in this moment, why is my subconscious, why is my brain talking about this? What is going on? What is it anxious about? What is it afraid of? What is it excited about? And then slowly kind of, okay, I'm gonna focus on this or I'm going to, okay, I know what this is now. I'm gonna just shove it aside allow myself mm -hmm. calm, allow myself to engage. Mm -hmm. It uh, transformed the practice for me, really. Yeah. I remember getting introduced to it in university. Uh, this would have been about 10 years ago, and I didn't really like it. I didn't get it. Um, and I found it very frustrating because I, I, I would tell myself I wasn't doing a good job of the yeah. practice. And then it wasn't until I, I started engaging with it about five years ago again, which would have been you know, five years after university. Um, and I, I really started making sense of the practice from a perspective of, of gratitude and compassion towards yeah. myself. So that the thoughts that arose and the experience and the sensations that arose from those thoughts were something that I got curious about. I really just got engaged and, and fascinated by the mm -hmm. fact that I was a thinking being. Yeah. And um, and there's this, there's this YouTube video of a monk talking about the monkey mind. You know, you mentioned the monkey mind. And he said, rather than trying to control the monkey, like try to control a human, a child, uh, you just can't. And it's can't horribly, um, it takes a lot of work, a lot of energy, and it's a very frustrating cause. So rather than asking the monkey to, to stop being a monkey, to, rather than asking the mind to stop being a mind, 
allow your mind to focus on something. You know, give the monkey a task. Hey, monkey, pay attention to this. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what we're doing in our mindfulness practice. Hey, mind, pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of leads us into the experience of, well, what is this mindfulness practice? The first thing is, is finding that anchor. Hey, mind, pay attention to this anchor point. You know, pay attention to my breath. Notice that when I'm inhaling, I'm inhaling. Notice that when I'm exhaling, I'm exhaling. Pay attention to the weight of gravity as it's pressing me into my seat. You know, pay attention to the temperature of the room and the air. Pay attention to what's happening, honestly. Like, mm -hmm. not just that person's wrong, that person's bad. No, like, what's actually happening? Where is their disconnect and where is their, where is their relational strain? And, and how is my contribution to that strain making it worse you know what I mean or, or where can I take responsibility for 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 the for the experience of, of being an agent of this right yeah and and that's ultimately what this mindfulness practice is it's, it's paying attention it's listening but it's paying attention and listening without judgment and I think that's mm -hmm. very distinct right like it's so easy to go through life assuming that we should have the answers and have have things figured out but mapping and making sense of the mind is incredibly complicated. You know, it's very similar to, um, do, you, do either of you play music? A little bit of A piano. little bit of music? Perform music or play music as in hit play on? <laughs> <laughs> so, fair enough. So uh, when, did you know that there's people who can listen to a piece of music mm -hmm. and they can pick up their instrument and they can follow along, they can make sense of it, they can break it down for you, they can explain to you why things are structured the way that they're structured. Yeah. These are people who really understand music. You know, these are individuals who, who get their instrument. And, and what we're doing and navigating through in, in our mindfulness practice is something similar. You know, we're making sense of the notes. Mm -hmm. The notes of our own own experiences, our own feelings, our own emotions, our own thoughts. You know, making sense of the own notes of our own being has huge implications for the way that we're able to, for lack of a better word, and to stick with the analogy, perform in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, to to show up for for the people that that are in our environment and in our in our circle. Mm -hmm. You know, and to actually be there for them, right? And to make sense of of why I respond this way every time I see this person in my life, why I react this way every time I I experience this this situation. Right when I'm when I'm under stress, I, I notice that this whole range of emotions and experiences that I I thought I understood, it's actually got a little bit of a different tint. It's like putting a pair of glasses on. It's got a whole different flavor to it when I'm under stress, and then it's got a different flavor again when I'm with my loved ones, and then it's got a different flavor again when I'm in this environment and that mm -hmm. environment, right? And so depending on the the stimulus of my environment, it changes the way that I I can show up in the world. Yeah, there's something that uh, Dr. Brene Brown mm -hmm. is my favorite. Yeah. Says, <laughs> um, Girl crush. No, totally. um, but she talks about how when something happens to us like positive or negative usually negative we give ourselves a story we give ourselves a narrative of what happened mm -hmm. um, so if you know when we leave here and um, maybe you know you say goodbye to me but Jeremiah just walks right out I think oh he didn't like me and <laughs> maybe you had to you know move your car or whatever um, but you make up that story. She calls yeah. it her SFD, which I don't think I'm allowed to say the first <laughs> word. But, um, what does F or S and D stand for? Uh, the F is first draft. Okay. The S is the word gotcha. I'm not supposed yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, okay, gotcha. um, So you give a first draft, and it's okay to have that first draft mm -hmm. of, you know, maybe acknowledging you're acknowledging that this is the what you think is happening mm -hmm. and acknowledging it to that person as well say yeah. you know Jer like when you left i felt like you didn't like me or and <laughs> and you can say no 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 like that was not the situation but we tell ourselves these stories maybe to cope with everything that's going on around us or just to make sense because we are you know we want to seek truth or we want to seek understanding and that's the way that we do that to ourselves and that can you know, ruin relationships and so sometimes... So quickly, yeah, mm -hmm. all the time, right? Yeah. And so having that first draft allows you to get everything out there and, you know, make room for a second draft to make more sense of what actually happened in the situation. Yeah, and that's Brene Brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that again because she's doing a lot of amazing work in, in regards to the, the category of compassion and, and gratitude. Mm -hmm. and just kind of making sense of the way that we show up in the world. She's a psychologist, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. Or a so sociologist. 
I might be wrong. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. <laughs> but read everything of hers because sure. she does amazing work in making you feel that you're not alone in the way that, and making you feel not alone, but also making you feel empowered yeah. to take responsibility and to have intention and to, uh, and to show up when you may otherwise be afraid to. Yeah, it's and such a key thing. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I, I think is really important to articulate is just the quick framework and structure of, of what this mindfulness practice is. First is breathing. Breathing has huge implications. It evokes the parasympathetic response. It gets you connected to what's happening. It kind of grounds you and it lets you give, it gives you a really strong anchor to be able to focus on. And then placing your attention on the anchor that you've chosen to, to, to pay attention to. And you can open up your senses for that, you know? You've got five senses, you've got the environment that you're in, you've got the gravity that you can feel on your skin, you've got the taste, you've got smell, you've got things that you can see if your eyes are open or if they're closed. Uh, you, can, you can just allow yourself to tune in to what's actually happening in this present time. And then one of the most important aspects of this is just to accept and understand, you know, that whatever arises is not meant to be judged. It's meant to just be observed. You know, almost like you're observing it in somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we observe children playing and we see them do ridiculous things, but we just kind of let them at it because we're fascinated by the, the chain of events that arise out of that. Stopping the behavior doesn't give you that opportunity. It's the same thing with yourself. Stopping the behavior of your thoughts or whatever it is doesn't give you the opportunity to glean information and understanding from that. I used to feel guilt because I figured Gandhi could meditate and go for weeks without eating it. I can't go 15 minutes without thinking about tacos. <laughs> I get into my practice and I'm like, oh man, I could really go for tacos right now. And it's that, I just think, and that's again that negative feedback loop, but if you just acknowledge it and let it go for what it is. For sure. I don't have to be Gandhi. No, no, it's a high benchmark to live up to. <laughs> And so then we're, we're, we're observing without judgment and then we're coming back to the beginning, back to the breath. Right, once you've observed, you come back to your breathing and just allow yourself yeah. to repeat that over and over. That's what we're doing. Breathing, observing, finding that judge or that observation without judgment, and then coming back into your breath. And just kind of repeating that over and over and over. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been Body Works with Marcus. Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. This is Rogers TV. Waterloo Wolves Minor Midget Game Day Experience is back for another season. On Saturday, during the Wolves' home opener, young Major Adam hockey players had the opportunity to take a tour of the dressing room, sit in on a video session, and meet the players. For these 9- and 10-year-olds, it was a great learning experience, seeing what goes into playing AAA hockey with the Wolves. Sean Dietrich is the driving force behind the game day program and it's been a huge hit with the young players and their parents. We talk about our guys giving back and uh, it's not just about the minor midget program it's about water minor hockey so we want our younger players to see have something to strive for to play here and we want them to be